Hello, Booktube. Well, it's, it's very, very late at night after a very busy, very Skypey day. Uh, and I once again have a little mail haul. Uh, that I, <laughs> and once again, the shaky cam. Uh, I have a little mail haul here that I, I got and then I let it sit while I was doing other stuff. Uh, I thought we'd open it together and see what we have here. And it's it's an odd, it's got an odd feel to it. Uh, it, it feels like the, it's going to have surprises. I don't know where that feeling comes from, but we'll... We'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. It could be completely conventional. Although when it comes to me, there's hardly a conventional uh, mail haul. Uh, so let's see, what, let's see what this first one is. Oh, oh, very nice. Okay. This comes out in April. I requested it because it's just the sort of thing I'm going to like. Uh, this is Lady in Red, an intimate portrait of Nancy Reagan by Sheila Tate. Uh, and it's these... Uh, it's these Reagan people these Reagan administration people, the lower level people, this, uh, Sheila Tate was press secretary for the first lady. Uh, and, but you know, other people too, the Reagan people are now getting the ones who were there as idealistic young Republicans are now at the age where they're starting to write their memoirs. And, and I'm very glad of it because the more books like this we get, the better I like it. I, I really, really love presidential history administration history, administration biographies. Uh, so although this is, this is probably going to be, you know, fairly slight in terms of historical importance, it's still going to be endlessly interesting for me. I was directly in the, uh, in the trenches when we, when editorial writers were writing lots of pieces about Nancy Reagan that weren't very nice. Uh, so this, this will be great. Wonderful. Fantastic. I will, uh, I will read it, and I, I hope that I will review it. I will certainly, if I don't review it anywhere else, I will certainly review it for Open Letters Review, uh, which you ought to do too. <laughs> if you're reading a new release, or if you're reading an old book that you want to write about, there might be a way for us to hook it to some new concern. You should let me know if you feel like reviewing something. Uh, let me get this thing here, whatever this is, uh, in this odd package too. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a package that would come from a publisher at all. Uh, Oh, it's a package inside a package. What else could that be? Goodness gracious. Oh, and it's packed like Fort Knox. See, did I tell you? It's, it's got a kind of a hinky feel to it. This whole thing does. I don't know what this is, but it, this has to come from... This can't possibly come from a publisher. This is something else again. What, what have we got here? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. There's a package inside the package that was inside the package. Uh, oh, let's see. Let's see if brute force will work where the scissors did not. No. Wow. This just does not want to come free. See, no no publisher would ever bother to make it this way. Huh. This, will you look at that? <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't think that what's in here is going to survive me opening it, but let's, let's see. Uh, what we got here? Oh, oh, fantastic. I actually ordered this for somebody online a long time ago. I completely forgot about it. This is a paperback of Marvel Masterworks Fantastic Four Volume 8. There, you, that you Marvel fans are going to be... Con First of all, you Marvel fans out there will be too young to remember this issue. And you'll be confused, because those are the good guys. That's Spider-Man, Thor, and Daredevil fighting the heroes of the Fantastic Four. Uh, and that's because they the uh, Fantastic Four assumes that they are androids masquerading as superheroes and in the employ of Dr. Doom. So our heroes end up fighting and it's so awesome. It's just so awesome. The, the, uh, the human torch fights Spider-Man daredevil fights to fit Mr. Fantastic and Thor fights the thing. Was, this was during a time in Thor's continuity where, uh, his, his crazy father, Odin, had stripped him of his immortal powers. All he has is his physical strength, which is the only reason that the thing lasts even half a second. But uh, it's wonderful. Just I, It was uh, the first issue of the Fantastic Four that I truly loved. Uh, and so I, when I saw that it was in a volume that probably has a lot of other stuff that I love in it as well. This is right around the period that I really loved the Fantastic Four. And I, I immediately went and looked around at my graphic novel to see if I had it, and I don't. Uh, so now I do. That's great. Uh, I love it. See, Thor can't fly. He doesn't have his superpowers. He only has his physical strength, which is just part of his physiology. Uh, so, uh, 
when he tells Spider-Man that he can't fly, Spider-Man has to web him across town. <laughs> uh, and when they're, when they're going across town, there's a great exchange where Thor says, I do not relish the prospect of waging battle against the indomitable Fantastic Four. They have ever espoused the cause of justice and truth. Uh, to which Spider-Man replies, uh, I don't like the idea of slugging it out with them either, but mostly because they've got a bad habit of never losing. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> oh, this has lots of other stuff, too. This is classic Lee and Kirby Fantastic Four. Great. Wow. What a treat. Uh, what a treat. Okay, that's great. Uh, now we'll move on. This, this next one also feels, feels strange. Let's see what this is. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Oh, my. Look at that. All right. Okay, this one I, I don't think I can probably show you. Uh, this is... a. a a commission, but it's it's uh, I'm not 100% sure where I stand there. I'm not 100% sure that I can mention that I'm reviewing it early. Uh, but that's all right. We've got other things to look at. I, I, that's great, though. I'm glad to have it because that's I've been waiting for it. And then we have two boxes, and then we'll be done with this little thing here. Uh, I do I do so like getting a commission in the mail. It's a, it's a nice feeling. Those of you who are, who maybe don't do it. And maybe think you might like to. That's a, it's a nice feeling. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. So what is this next one? Uh, okay. All right. This is from Oxford. Uh, comes out in a couple of days. I don't think. I don't recall requesting it. Uh, it's, a, it's a cute little book. I don't really know what it is, though. What have we got here? It's called The Finest Building in America. The New York Crystal Palace. 1853 to 1858 by Edwin Burroughs. It's a little thing. Getting little books here. Uh, and it is, when first opened to the public in 1853, New York's Crystal Palace created a sensation. Uh, those who had seen London's Crystal Palace, the famous one, uh, uh, the structure w was openly intended to emulate, argued that America's copy far surpassed it. Built in what today is Bryant Park, a four-acre four site between 40th and 42nd Street, the Colossus of Glass and Steel indeed seemed poised to displace the British original in worldwide fame. Walt Whitman pronounced it an unsurpassed anywhere for beauty. Are we sure that's what Whitman was talking about? <laughs> uh, young Samuel Clemens, not yet Mark Twain, called it a perfect fairy palace. Yeah, I'm thinking I know what Mark what Walt Whitman was talking about. Uh, uh, many perceived it as putting America still in the thrall of European culture on the map. To us on this side of the water, wrote newspaperman Horace Greeley, who had also visited London's Crystal Palace, it was original. But it was, by definition, not original. It was an explicit copy of the British original. That always kills me when people do that. I saw it uh, recently, there was, there's a... Uh, a few, a couple of years ago, there's a, a cable show uh, called Shameless, uh, starring William Macy in, in, as an alcoholic in the head at the head of a family of alcoholics. And when he was when it was originally starting up, and he was doing press for the show, he got in front of a, an interviewer and he said, "I just think it's amazing. You have never seen anything like this before." The, pro the pilot episode of the American version of Shameless was a scene-by-scene, line-by-line remake of the pilot episode of the British version. <laughs> so, there wasn't the same context, the same concept done in American style. It was literally the exact same thing with different actors. So you had seen exactly the same thing before. <laughs> uh, but who, who is Edmund Burroughs when he's at home? This is a very pretty little book. I wonder if he can find serious history about this thing. I bet he can. I bet it'll be interesting. Uh... Oh, he's the co-author of Gotham, A History of New York to 1898. That was a great book. Uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize for history, yeah. Uh, uh, and he's the Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus at Brooklyn College. He's done a whole bunch of lecturing. So he's just a, a thoroughly professional historian. Great, fantastic. So this will be this will be fascinating. It's also it's also heavily illustrated. That's it's a it's a neat little book. I, he you could you could easily see Oxford maybe being tempted to go a different route with this. Uh, I'm glad they went this route. Uh, uh, you know, a pretty little hardcover that's heavily illustrated uh, is the better route I think to go here. Great. Okay. Uh, and then this last box, and then we're done. Uh, so what do we got here? Needless to say, that sound you hear of shredding in the background is my little dog. She loves to shred things. <laughs> What the fuck is next here? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. 
Oh, All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. This this comes out uh, on February first. I did not know this was coming. <laughs> this is a gigantic biography of Tom Yockey. <laughs> Subtitle is The Patriarch of the Boston Red Sox. Oh, <laughs> oh my. <laughs> okay, so this is by Bill Nolan, who's been Vice President of the Society for American Baseball Research since 2004 and one of the co-founders of Rounders Records. He's written more than 35 Red Sox-related books. And now he's done a biography of Tom Yockey. Someday, book two. Ooh. <laughs> I could tell you tales about Tom Yockey. <laughs> it would set the several hairs on end, like quills upon the fretful porpentine. <laughs> oh my. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's read a little about it. We have the time. Uh, let's see. Few people have influenced the team as much as did Tom Yockey, as owner of the Boston Red Sox. After purchasing the Red Sox for $1.2 million in 1932, Yockey poured millions into building a better team and making the franchise relevant again. Although the Red Sox never won a World Series under Yockey's ownership, there were still many highlights. Lefty Grove won his 300th game. Jimmy Fox hit 50 home runs. Ted Williams batted 400, 406 in 1941. And both Williams and Kalia Stremski won triple crowns. Yawkey was viewed by fans as a genial autocrat who ran his ball club like a hobby more than a business and who spoiled his players. He was perhaps too trusting, oh my God, <laughs> uh, relying on flawed cronies rather than the most competent executives to run his ball club. One of his most unfortunate legacies was the accusation that he was a racist. Since the Red Sox were the last major league team to integrate and his inaction in this regard haunted both him and the team for decades. As one of the last great patriarchal owners in baseball, he was the first person elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame who hadn't been a player, uh, manager, or general manager. The author takes a close look at Yawkey's life as a sportsman and as one of the leading philanthropists in New England and South Carolina. Okay. And he also addresses Yawkey's leadership style and issues of racism during his tenure with the Red Sox. Okay, so it's pretty clear, even from that cover copy, which uh, Nolan need not have written, but almost certainly had to approve, it's pretty clear that this is going to be the best effort ever at a positive revisionist biography of Tom Yawkey. And believe it or not, I am all on board with that. I, this is what I love about biography. I, I know quite a bit about the Yawkeys. Uh, and what I want now, now that I've read that, that jacket copy, which is only fair, that's what any reader can do. Any reader can pick up a book and read that. I don't think as a reviewer I'm doing anything wrong by reading that. Now that I've read it and I get a fair sense of where the book is going to head, my first thought is, okay, make your case. I'm listening and I'm not angry. Make your case. And if you convince me at the end of this book that Tom Yockey was, you know, too trusting and misunderstood, then I will spread your gospel. I will, I will sing the praises of your book, and I will spread the word. Uh, so we'll see. This is this is coming out right away. It's probably in bookstores already, and I've just got to read it. It's it's now even ahead of the Fantastic Four. Uh, okay, all right. Wow, what a weird mail haul, even for this channel. So we have a big, fat, new, ambitious biography of Tom Yockey. Incredible. Incredible. Uh, we have the Fantastic Four, in, uh, including the issue where they fight with other Marvel heroes. Uh, we have Lady in Red, which looks like an affectionate memoir of, of uh, Nancy Reagan's time in the White House by her former press secretary. And the finest building in America. <laughs> about the American copy of the Crystal Palace. Uh, so there you go. And one other book that I, I, I will I will point it to you. I will point, I will direct your attention to it once I review it. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got these. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So so there you go. I felt it had been a little long since I did a mail haul. I'll, I'll post this when the sun comes up. Uh, and I'll, I'll post other things besides. This won't be the only thing. So I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.